In this video, we're going to work through the math in Appendix 6b. You'll recall that at the, we ended Appendix 6a uh, by noting uh, the situation in which the equivalent and compensating variation are both equal to the change in consumer surplus. Uh, in this appendix, they take that one step further, building on the work of Willig, uh, to show exactly how big of a difference they are. They start with uh, the equation 6.34. Key new parameter here are eta1 and eta2, which are bounds on the income elasticity. That is, we know that the uh, the true income elasticity of demand for the good that we're going to be considering here that has a price change uh, falls between eta1 at the lower end and eta2 at the upper end. The equation 6.34 is um, not very intuitive, so let's see how on earth they get this. We're going to start by simply taking the log of both sides of the expression, and you, you, that brings the, the eta terms down, uh, indicated there, and then uh, we can simply uh, expand out the logs, um, noting that the, the log of a difference is equal to the uh, difference of the logs, uh, and that's where we get to this line here. Dividing both sides by the difference in the logs um, uh, between M1 and M0, we obtain this expression here, which now is starting to look a little bit more familiar uh, since we've got eta1 and eta2 bounding that expression. And this, of course, is simply the difference in the logs of, um, of the quantities. They, that's Marshallian demand over the difference in the logs of the, the income levels. And the inside of that uh, dual inequality is, of course, the, the discrete definition of the elasticity of demand with respect to income. Uh, we then uh, can substitute in for income as income is equal to the expenditure function. Now we can write, rewrite a 6.34. Instead of using M1, we substitute in uh, expenditure function uh, wherever M1 appeared in equation 6.34. Now we're going to work with just one side of the inequality, that is the, uh, the less than or equal to side, the first two terms. Uh, and we now have uh, this expression here. We've simply multiplied both sides of that inequality through by our Marshallian demand function. Uh, and that brings us, gets us um, uh, that expression there. Uh, simplifying expression by simply taking the m sub 0 term out of the uh, the second term on the left hand side gives us this. We divide both sides through by e of p u naught to the eta 1 to obtain this expression here. Now we use the fact that the Marshallian demand when evaluated at a particular point is also equal to the Hicksian demand as expressed here, which of course is the derivative of the expenditure function with respect to the price. So we can now separate or substitute in for the Marshallian demand function, the derivative of the expenditure function with respect to the price as shown here. So now we're going to get a little fancy. We're going to use the fact that the right-hand side is a differential equation, and we're going to solve that. So what this means is the derivative of the expenditure function with respect to the price times the expenditure function to the negative eta 1 is equal to the 1 over 1 minus eta 1 times the derivative of the expenditure function to the 1 minus eta 1 with respect to the price. So if you check that, we can work through the math like this. We take the derivative of all of that, and we simplify terms. We notice that we can cancel the 1 over 1 minus 1 over 1 minus eta 1 cancels out, which leaves us with just the expression exactly like we, we had it up above. Hence, the inequality that we had up above, which is written here, can be rewritten uh, in this way right here. So that takes care of the first two parts of the inequality expression. Uh, now we can focus on the second part of the inequality expression. We go through exactly the same process and end up with this expression here, uh, again using the differential equation trick that we had above. So let's pop back up to the, the first two sides of that inequality expression. 
On the left hand side we have the Marchalian demand and on the right hand side we have this expression 1, one over 1 minus 801 times the derivative of the expenditure function to the 1 minus uh, 801 with respect to uh, pi. What we're going to do now is integrate both sides of that expression between p i0 and pi1. That is, we're going to start to be now really focused on evaluating uh, that price change. The left hand side of this expression is simply, of course, the area underneath uh, the demand curve, that is the Marshallian demand curve, times the expression m0 to the minus eta1. Since m0 to the minus eta1 is constant over that the range of that integral, uh, we can take that out of the expression as we've done here, and we note that the right hand side of that equation is simply the area underneath the Marshallian demand curve. That is, if this is our Marshallian demand curve, a downward sloping function of uh, uh, price, then the integral between pi0 and pi1 is going to be the area, the green area indicated here. Again, noticing that we are integrating um, over price, so it's not a vertically um, vertical distance, but rather a horizontal distance in this case. And of course, we have a common name for the area underneath the uh, Marshallian demand curve. That's called consumer surplus. And so the uh, the left hand side of the expression above is simply minus m0 to the minus eta1 times the change in consumer surplus. Now let's focus on the right hand side of that inequality, uh, the integral of 1 minus eta1 times the derivative of the expenditure function to the 1 minus eta1 with respect to price. Again, the 1 minus eta1 part of that uh, integral can be taken out since it's constant. And the good news is that the second part of that integral is we're integrating over price, but we're inside the, um, the integral is a derivative with respect to price. So the integral is simply the evaluation of that, um, that argument, that is the expenditure function to the 1 minus eta 1. Though we have to evaluate that over the range pi0 and pi1, that is the range over which we've taken the integral. We substitute those in here, and here I'm using the bold notation P1 and P0 to refer to the price vector in which the uh, ith element is has changed um, between 1 and 0. Remembering that the expenditure function when evaluated at that particular point is also equal to the income, we can substitute M0 in place of the expenditure function and we obtain this relationship here. And similarly we can obtain the other side, that is the eta2 side, uh, the uh, third part, or the, the middle and, and last right hand part of the, the big inequality that we started out. And again, we can express, uh, express that uh, as a function of our change in consumer surplus. Note that uh, the right hand side of 6.37 and the left hand side of 6.38 are the same uh, with the exception that eta1 and eta2 have been changed. Now let's work with 6.38, that is the eta2 part of that inequality. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to multiply both sides by 1 minus eta2. In this case we're going to assume that 1 minus eta2 is greater than 0 so that the, the direction of that inequality doesn't change signs. We're going to come back to that uh, noting that if uh, 1 minus eta2 were less than 0, the direction of the inequality would change. We divide both sides by m0 to the 1 minus eta2 here and simplify noting that of course, the second term on the left-hand side is equal to 1, and the, uh, the m0 um, ratio on the right-hand side, the minus a to 2 part of that product cancels out, leaving us with simply 1 over m0. Take 1 over to the right-hand side. And now to simplify notation, we're going to define s as minus the change in consumer surplus divided by income. That is, you can think about um, the the delta S over M0 as equal to the percentage change in income that is uh, re uh, represented by the change in consumer surplus.
substituting in this new notation little s, we obtain that. And we're going to take both sides to the 1 over 1 minus eta 2 uh, as indicated here. Note that now we're, we're taking both sides to a power. If the 1 minus eta 2 is greater than 0, then this doesn't affect the sign of or the direction of the inequality. If 1 minus eta 2 is less than 0, then it's going to swip it, switch it. So that means it's going to switch it back um, from when we had that switch above. So we're, we're left with the direction of the inequality is un unchanged at the end of the day, whether 1 minus eta 2 is greater than 0 or 1 minus eta 2 is less than 0. Canceling the 1 minus eta 2 um, term in the power on the left-hand side, we get this simplified expression here. Following exactly the same process we could have gone through for the eta 1 part of that big inequality uh, to obtain this. And so we have the expenditure function divided by m0 is equal to, is between uh, those two terms on the right hand side of 6.39 and 6.40. We put those two together and we get this expression here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to divide or uh, subtract from uh, the uh, all sides of that inequality, that is the left side, the middle, and the, and the right hand side, 1, which we're going to write as m0 over m0 in the middle. So now you see that the middle part of that expression has in the numerator the expenditure function at p1 minus m0, which is equal to the expenditure function at p0. Uh, so that is exactly equal to compensating variation. So we can rewrite it as compensating variation as we've done here. Now we're going to add the change in consumer surplus divided by income to all three parts of that inequality. So now the middle part of that expression is equal to the change in consumer surplus minus the compensating variation. That is the difference between the change in consumer surplus and um, compensating variation. The error that we would make if we used consumer surplus changes instead of the true correct um, compensating variation. In order to express this difference as a percentage, we're going to divide all three parts of the inequality through by the absolute value of the change in consumer surplus divided by income, which can be simplified uh, as shown here. Now, the middle part of that is the most important part. That's the, uh, uh, the difference between the consumer surplus and compensating variation relative to the change in consumer surplus. That is the percentage error uh, that you have when using consumer surplus instead of uh, compensating variation. The outside parts uh, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side are complicated functions of little s and eta 1 and eta 2. So what they do is they say, well, let's just call those something. We're going to call them a little epsilon kc and little epsilon, um, well, little epsilon kc for 1 and 2, that is the lower and the upper bound. and we are left with the expression that is the percentage change, uh, the percentage error that you get by using uh, consumer surplus instead of compensating variation is bounded by those two terms. We're not going to do it here, but you could also get the exact same uh, relationships for equivalent variation uh, using slightly different um, uh, terms, epsilon e. So where do we end up? What we get is that we have expressions for the percentage error that arises when we use consumer surplus instead of compensating or equivalent variation. And those errors, the bounds on those errors, are functions of eta 1 and eta 2, that is the, the income elasticities that, that we know might exist, and the change in consumer surplus as a percentage of income that exists. And what are the quantitative implications of this? If you look at table 6.1, you'll see that the percentage errors that arise are functions of those income elasticities and the, uh, the change in consumer surplus as a percentage of income. And uh, they're, in my opinion, they're not very big. Of course, we know that if income elasticity is equal to 0, 
uh, then the error will be exactly equal to zero. But even at the extremes of this table, that is uh, the bottom right hand side uh, where you've got uh, change in consumer surplus as a percentage of income at 25 percent, we're talking huge impacts on consumer surplus and very high levels of income elasticity, our errors there are between 20 and 33 percent. Well now that's substantial, but in many instances that's not out of order with the range of uncertainty that you already have in your parameter estimates for your model. Uh, if you're working for uh, the US government and you're evaluating a major price change, yeah, it's probably going to be important that you make the adjustment. But if the uh, you're working on smaller uh, effects that are talking about a good that is a pretty um, tiny part of of total uh, income expenditures, then our errors are very likely to be uh, well within 5% or 10%, which um, for most applications is totally reasonable. Just Shoots and Smiths do two um, more things that are important in this chapter. First, they look at the uh, case of multiple price changes, and you'll see that the expression is very similar to the expressions that we showed above for the single price change. The only difference is that we're now uh, summing up the consumer surplus changes as we've done in previous applications. The other thing they do is derive some uh, approximations for those percentage errors uh, using linear approximations, which if, as again, if you're in a situation where uh, exact quantitative predictions are important, then you probably need to go back and rely on this. But the bottom line of this um, section, and this is an important implication, is that although we're interested in compensating variation or equivalent variation, we can use the change in consumer surplus for price changes without too much concern. That's all I'm going to say about uh, Appendix uh, 6B. It was a lot of math, but uh, I hope uh, it makes it clear that there is a strong, rigorous foundation for using uh, consumer surplus changes to approximate compensating or equivalent variation for price changes.